that day and, and, and God forbid was a fly on the wall that morning, the white man wasn't terrorizing you. You voluntarily did what you did because you love white people. You love the white man. And you know, the white man isn't terrorizing you. Can't make this up. Same thing when I was in college. Like I said before, want to be Erica Badu, black girls beating on drums. Be These stupid me. poetry <laughs> sessions. The white man is the greatest evil that we have ever had. And then, you know, they get to doing all this stupid stuff. But then at night, they're getting their, their butts clapped. By a white boy on campus. Tell me I'm lying. Are these people that evil? Are these people that bad? Are they terrorizing you that bad? Because th that you willingly give up the, the most sacred thing about your existence is your sexuality? You can't make this up. You can't make this crap up. I'm telling you. You can't make this up, man. It's just like when people used to tell me the white man used to kill black men for being around white women. How? When black, you mean to tell me black men in the 20s and the 30s, were they really scared? No, they, they weren't. It, I don't believe society was that bad back then, to be honest with you. Mm, truth. <laughs> hey, listen, when he said that, I said, okay, he, he either been watching the show or he coming around on yeah. his own. I don't know. And I'll tell you, I after everything I've seen, since I've been an adult, that's the same thoughts I've had. In a world that's now full of black superstars in sports, he was the first, Marshall Walker Taylor, but you can call him Major. He was born on November 26, 1878 in Indianapolis. One of Born in 1878. This, he was the biggest athlete in America when, at his time. Watch this. Listen to this. Of eight children. He would go to work with his father, and his father worked as a coachman for the Southern family, Albert Southern, and they had a son named Daniel, and Daniel was around the same age as Major. From age eight until he was 12, Taylor spent much of his time with the wealthy family, keeping Daniel company. They eventually employed him as their son's companion, giving him the same clothing and education, but the biggest gift. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So his dad worked for some white people. They was rich. And they took him in and gave him the same exact life as they gave their own son. It was yet to come. And so when Daniel received a bicycle, Major also received a bicycle. And so he would learn to ride the bike and he would ride and he would learn to do trick riding. There's no doubt Taylor's circumstances were unique, especially for a black child in Indiana during the 1800s. Yeah, he was the only one, you know? They got to make sure they, they let you know. Yeah, the got to let you know. He, he the exception. Everybody else was getting beat, and, and, and <laughs> it was sundown towns. He, he was the special token Negro. Yeah, white men would often use Assume. bikes to ride around town and beat black people. <laughs> yeah, man. He was just lucky, man. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't get no ideas, big ideas, man. His comfortable life would be upended. In 1890, the Southerns moved to Chicago, leaving Taylor behind. But he would soon find himself on a new path, one that would change the course of his life. He would also work at a local bicycle shop, the Hay and Willis Bicycle Shop. Mr. Hay was so impressed by Taylor, he offered him a new job, paying $6 a week and a $35 bicycle, hoping that his talents would allure more customers to his store. Every day at 4 p.m., Taylor would perform stunts in a military uniform in front of the store, which earned him the nickname Major. And with a push from Mr. Hay, he entered his first race at 13 and won by 15. So he, he entered his first race at 13. Okay? What a terrible life this son man had. Well, he gets better. Major. And with a push from Mr. Hay, he entered his first race at 13 and won. By 15, he was smashing records in amateur contests across the state. By 1898, he had already set seven world records. 
fight, 1899. He had won the World One Mile in Montreal, Canada, and he was also a sprint champion that year. Taylor's journey was picking up speed after gaining the attention of former cycling champion Louis Bertie Munger, who believed heavily in Taylor's racing ability. In exchange for housework, Taylor would receive the training he needed to nurture his racing career as Bertie's protege. Despite his early victories, Taylor... So the greatest cyclist at the time took him in as his protege. <laughs> had difficulties racing against him, both from the speed factor and then also from the race. He had many difficulties where cyclists would actually cause physical harm. There was at one point that he was choked nearly unconscious, another point where he was elbowed. Despite that, he became... He got elbowed. But I believe that I be, I, be, I believe that though, like there That's were gonna be. Like, but yeah, I'm just saying, there there is gonna be some cyclists that wasn't gonna like him because of his color. Yeah, not yeah. all, not all of them. Yeah, but they were, yeah, yeah. But but here's my thing. How do we know he wasn't elbowing and choking people too? Because of course, of course. You of course. If you get true. elbowed, if you get elbowed, I'm gonna elbow you back at the time. So I'm not saying it didn't happen. Because if he's the best, if he was the best, he was probably physical. Like he wasn't just like being nice out being the best. Of, of course, you got to be physical right back. But some of them didn't like him. Like this, you know, this color, this color boy beating me. And it, it goes vice versa, but I'm not saying all the cyclists. Don't get me wrong. In the sport's top athlete and in popular demand, Taylor negotiated his own contracts and earned himself a place as one of the wealthiest black people in the country. Racing promoters from overseas were taking notice. He would then leave the United States and experience and race in many places around the world, becoming an international superstar. Taylor's winning streak will continue from 1901 to 1904. He eventually retired in 1910 at 32 years old. After various debts and serious illnesses, he lost most of his fortune in the 1920s. Two years before his death, he wrote and self-published his autobiography, The Fastest Bicycle Rider in the World. Taylor died in 1932. He was 50. His wife. Oh, man. Of course, you, got, you already know, man. Sun, sun men been been sun men in for, for centuries, though. Bridge but of the nose, uh, bridge of the nose. Yeah, exactly. Allegedly, though, at that time, you know, he's supposed to get lynched, right? He's supposed to get, they supposed to lynch them and never supposed to be able to touch. Look at a you can't look at a white woman, remember? Because in material, you can't look oh, at a white woman. smoke. I find it funny how he got a light skinned girl. <laughs> She look like white to me. Bro, she look she like, like a white, white woman, woman, yeah. She look like a white woman. But Taylor I, died in 1932. Like he was 53. Impoverished and buried in an unmarked grave, a group of pro bike racers donated money to have Taylor's body buried properly. During the 1980s, Indianapolis honored his hometown hero with the completion of the Major properly. Taylor Velodrome in Marion University, honoring the man who blazed his own trail. Yep. No, I, I agree. I could see there being a lot of white people, but but you have a point. I mean, if it was so bad back then, they would have just lynched him and been done with it. But it sounds like he looked the typical held in his heart for a black kid like him. Bro. You know, he was famous, rich, and then he married a white woman, bro. I mean, the yeah. same shit that's going on there. Here go, here go some black people talking about it. I think this is Amazing <laughs> Oh my god <laughs> Cringe Shall always Will always Be My song of praise For it was great That bought my liberty. Of course, it's a white dude. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Um, man, like, 
it's like honor to the guy, but fuck, man, he wasn't a saint. I'm out of breath over here. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. He go another black man from that era, man. That's Jack Johnson. Why can people have with white people? Is it white people yeah. actually look at them? They can see oh, them. That boy loves swirling. Jack Johnson was a big, black, dark-skinned man. See, extremely dark-skinned black guys in particular, everybody is put out by them. Because when they come on the scene, everybody tends to feel they're in the presence of something aboriginal. What the fuck? He looked like a bullfrog. Somebody though. like Jack Johnson. Everybody's like, oh, now we're back at the beginning. He said that so I think people Johnson feel like they're in the presence of a proto-human when they're looking at dark skin black people. Like... Mm. Aboriginal. All projection. <laughs> they must have enjoyed it. They must have enjoyed being scared. We all go to see a horror movie because we like being scared. It's part of human nature, you know. Give me a scary booger booger bear and I'm going to be happy. And it wasn't just white people. The decent black folk didn't want their daughters associated with him. So he couldn't have a date with them. <laughs> So-called so decent black girl, whatever that meant. But um, the black Creole. The people that could pass the brown paper bag so test. That's what that meant. Blood, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, middle class black people were scared of him, terrified of him, as much as white people were. Advice to Jack Johnson. Those teeth. Mr. Why? Jack Johnson must conduct uh. himself in a modest manner. He can hurt the race immeasurably just now if he goes splurging and making a useless I mean, my man looks a little scary, I'm not going to lie. Itself. Yeah, I wouldn't want my dog. No, <laughs> Aside from the fact that he's a son, man, you know. Charge. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 yeah, he, he is scary. He got look like his teeth are filed sharp. Like, they just yeah, didn't want their daughters to end up being single moms. What's the problem with it? <laughs> right. Any undue exhibition on the part of Mister Johnson will hurt every member of the race. On the other hand, becoming modesty and self-control will win him many friends. The oh, New York he age. Got modesty was never part of Jack Johnson's makeup. Neither was self-control. <laughs> Everywhere oh, you don't say. Went, Jesus Christ, Troubles dude. now seem to follow. This guy couldn't control himself. It's mad. He had impulse control problems. Yeah, yeah, Everywhere impulse. the champion went. Trouble now seemed to follow. Some of it stirred up by his enemies, some of his own making. And certain unfair persons, piqued because I was champion, decided if they could not get me one way, they would another. Two years earlier, a new federal law had gone into effect. The Mann Act was named for its sponsor. Illinois Republican Congressman James Robert Mann. It barred the transportation of women in interstate or foreign commerce for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. A landmark of progressive era legislation, the Mann Act was intended to stop the luring of young women into prostitution, what was called the white slave traffic not private relationships between consenting adults. But officials of the Justice Department saw in it their chance to destroy Jack Johnson. The White so, Slave Act. So, yeah, they had to pass a law to prevent and stop the trade in young white women among black men, is what I'm hearing here? Yeah, man. 
In the eighteen, when is this again? It, it's a good, it's a good um st- show on on HBO a couple years ago called The Deuce. The Deuce is about Forty Second Street back in the sixties and the seventies, and it talked about the blacks pimping the white girls. Man, blacks was pimping the shit out of white girls back in the day. Man, it just was what it was. Man, check out I told the you. Deuce. He was a swirler, man. I told you. Johnson. By October of 1912, Johnson had a new companion, a 19-year-old prostitute from Milwaukee named Lucille Cameron. When her mother, Mrs. F. Cameron Falconet, came to Chicago and went to the police, charging Johnson with abducting her daughter, the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation agreed to take the case. Jack Johnson has hypnotic powers, Mrs. Cameron Falconet assured the press, and he has exercised them on my little girl. I would rather see my daughter spend the rest of her life in an insane asylum than see her. Her lawyer said that by having a relationship with his client's daughter, Jack Johnson had insulted every white woman in the United States. The Man Act. It was never aimed at an individual having a liaison with a secretary going from New York to Hoboken. It was aimed at commercialized vice. And the Attorney General of America, a man by the name of Wickersham, knew this. And when he was first approached with, with to use this against Jack Johnson, he understood that we, we can't do this, that this, this is a travesty. But eventually, Wickersham was convinced to go after Jack Johnson to pervert the law. On October 18th, 1912, Chicago police arrested Johnson for violating the Mann Act. The United States versus Jack Johnson decided to attack him on the basis of the sex life and the miscegenation. Miscegenation has always been uh, a preoccupation and a fixation in the, in, in the, in the mind of white America. Oh my God. Black men with white women. This had always been a concern. I think that it was exactly what the South did after it lost the Civil War. It lost the shooting war, but eventually it won the policy war and was able to keep the Constitution. What are these niggas talking about, man? This guy's on trial for a crime. He's a, He's not getting lynched. He's getting a fucking trial, and he's running around with white women. And he's, and he's on trial for, um, even though it's trumped up charges, he's still getting a trial. I think, I think Trump, Trump uh, parted him, too, on this. Oh, okay. There's a variation on the way that the South won after it lost. That's exactly what happened. Jack Johnson. We can't find anybody to beat him, so we'll just do what we've done before, which is just turn the law against him. Oh, all right. Johnson was released on $800 bail by nightfall. Lucille Cameron was locked up too. And when Johnson went to the bank to get $25,000 with which to try to bail her out, an angry mob gathered outside. There were shouts of lynch him, and Johnson had to take refuge inside his own cafe. A few days later, the city collector padlocked the Cafe de Champion and canceled its license, declaring Johnson an undesirable person and of bad character. Hey, yo, you gotta hear so this. So long uh, as I do not interfere. Um, so... Oh, God damn it, where'd it go? Uh... Yeah, while uh, during a three-month tour of Australia in 1907, Johnson had a brief affair with Alma Toy, a white woman. Oh no, okay, so he he had uh, r- relationships with two black prostitutes, and then those relationships caused him to say the heartaches which Mary Austin and Clara Kerr caused me led me to forever forswear colored women and determine that my lot henceforth would be cast only with white women. <laughs> <laughs> he 
1907. Uh, I, I missed that part in the documentary. Yeah, wait. Man, he was just <laughs> trying to be happy. Damn. God damn. Yeah, exactly. He just wanted to be happy. He was the original That's... divester. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, with any other man's wife, I shall claim the right to select the woman of my own choice. Nobody else can do that for me. I am not a slave, and I have the right to choose who my mate shall be without the dictation of any man. I have eyes, and I have a heart, and when they fail to tell me who I shall have as mine, I want to be put in a lunatic asylum. That don't sound like a scared black man. I don't know. As Johnson had always feared, some African Americans began to abandon him. October 26th, 1912. It is unfortunate that a man with money should use it in a way to injure his own people. In the eyes of those who are seeking to uplift his race and improve its conditions. I wish to say emphatically that Jack Johnson's actions did not meet my personal approval, and I am sure that they do not meet with the approval of the colored race. Man with muscle minus brains is a useless creature. Booker T. Washington. Wow. I think there are three black leaders in the first couple decades of the 20th century. One is Booker T. Washington, who has a message saying, hunker down, get education, work hard, save your money, be reliable, don't worry about social justice necessarily when they or go social advancement. <laughs> On the other hand, you have W.E.B. Du Bois, who stands for we want social equality. We want economic equality. We want advancement on all levels. And then there's Jack Johnson that says, I'm getting mine. I just want to be I just, I I just, I just want to Individualism, <laughs> egoism. To fuck all that social justice, where the white women's at? I do not look upon Jack Johnson as a race leader nor do I in any way endorse his life and mannerisms, for it will not pay anyone to follow it. But the whole world is upon him today. Behind it all, you can see a large degree of race prejudice. He got mixed up with white women. Yeah, a whole lot of prejudice, man. <laughs> but he was, he mean, was, they were all prostitutes. You know, they, they call Booker, I mean, they call... They quote Booker T. Washington, and it's like, but he had black prostitutes, and they just said in the beginning that this other woman was a white prostitute. It's like, I mean, he. I think he was pimping. He's turning them into prostitutes. It I could be he, that, too. He I was, like he how was, one yeah. side is, I like how it's like a whole ideological movement. You got one side talking about white supremacy, the other side talking about personal accountability, and he's like, "Look, man, nigga, where the white women at, bro? Like, this is five bitches." It's like that fucking yeah. Boondocks episode, almost to the to the same. Yeah, man. I mean, it just shows to show you, like, dudes were literally living their best lives back in the 1900s man and it coincides with all the stories we read about the 1900s man how they, they would have guns like if a white dude got wrong with them they would just grab their guns and go see what was up with them have you know what I'm saying? Man, <laughs> yeah. it was just it's just crazy man um how um history is like, how could those be the two most popular athletes of their time if it was the way they sell it, say it, tell us it is? Like, these dudes are, like, there would be no room for that. I don't give a fuck if you said, well, they was, that's because they was rich. And nah, motherfucker, that wouldn't be, if, if it was the way they tell us it was back then. They said the white man had his foot on our neck. 
Yeah, there wasn't no room for yeah, none I mean, of that it, shit. It, it's what they always do. They take evidence of something happening. Like, for instance, there was a mob that wanted to kill him when he went to the courthouse. That and wouldn't happen today. Look how fucking bold he was, though. Like, he was throwing it in white people's faces. We're not talking about, like, oh, he was just chilling. Like, he was a boxer. He was beating white people up in the ring. He was gallivanting around with white women. The white woman begged him to leave her daughter alone then she got the law on him then he gets arrested he bails out then he tries to bail the white woman out like of course there's gonna be some mob of fucking white people in 1900 that's gonna be like yo this dude is out of control what do you think this is hey, man? I, I put a video in the back chat about the history of the monkey wrench and how jack johnson invented it and the history of the name okay on June 25th, 1910, Congress passed the Mann Act, also known as the White Slave Traffic Act. It was aimed at keeping innocent girls from being lured into prostitution, but really offered a way to make a crime out of many kinds of consensual sexual activity. The congressional committees that debated the Mann Act did not believe that a girl would ever choose to be a prostitute unless she was drugged and held hostage. The law made it illegal to transport any woman or girl across state lines for any moral purposes. In 1917, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of two married California men, Drew Caminiti and Maury Diggs, who had gone on a romantic weekend getaway with their girlfriends to Reno, Nevada, and had been arrested. Following this decision, the Mann Act was used in all types of cases. Someone was charged with violating the Mann Act for bringing a woman from one state to another in order to work as a chorus girl in a theater. Wives began using the Mann Act against girls who ran off with their husbands, and the law was used for racist purposes. Jack Johnson, heavyweight champion of the world, was prosecuted for bringing a prostitute from Pittsburgh to Chicago, but the motivation for his arrest was public outrage over his marriages to white women. The most famous prosecutions under the law were those of Charlie Chaplin in 19... So, when it was used on Charlie Chapman, it wasn't racist. It was only racist when it was used on black guys. Yeah. Plus, didn't he kind of uh, do that? He kind of like transported a prostitute. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It was like it was because they hated him being with white women. Yeah, that's that's the thing. He was black, so it was when they when they happened to the white guys. You know, it was just they was business <laughs> as usual. It's the black guy. You know, it's the boot of the racist system. Outrage over his marriages to white women. The public talk about Jews. The most famous prosecutions under the law were those of Charlie Chaplin in 1944 and Chuck Berry in 1959 and 1961. Who took so Chuck Berry was also transporting. <laughs> Yo, oh god, these niggas wow. State lines. Yeah, man. I mean, just think about it, man. Like, there's no way it could, like, it could have been that bad, man. It couldn't have been. Every one of them got a whole gang glider, glider girls in the shed and shit. It couldn't have been that bad. Yeah, it's yeah. Impossible. I mean, there was definitely opinions on both sides, but if it was that bad, there would have just been genocide. Like, it would have just been like, it would have been like the Uyghurs in China. It would have been. They couldn't genocide these black, these black dudes was armed back then, man. Oh, they're armed today. Barry was convicted and spent two years in the prime of his musical career in jail. After Barry's conviction, the Mann Act was enforced only sparingly, but was never repealed. It was amended in 1978 and again in 1986. Most notably, the 1986 amendments replaced the phrase, any other immoral purpose with any sexual activity for which any person can be charged with a criminal offense. Here, this is President Trump just a few moments ago there in the Oval Office issuing a full posthumous pardon to boxer Jack Johnson. This is the president surrounded by a number of uh, number of VIPs and, and boxing legends there. Lennox Lewis, uh, of course, you see Sylvester Stallone, who arguably played uh, a fam played a famous boxer, of course. Sylvester, look how small Sylvester Stallone is compared Fucking to these Stallone. Boxers. Get the fuck out of here, Stallone! Like, what the fuck? Why are they like fucking? 